everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started. A few more people might trickle in, but we're really um, glad you're able to make it. My name is Nikki Batchelor. I am the prize director for the X Prize Carbon Removal. I'm joined with Rupa Danda Moody and Michael Leach, who are also on our team. Mike leads a lot of our technical work. He'll be kind of going through all the details of what's required for your demonstration in the competition. And Rupa will be handling all of our team relations. So she's here to be answering questions and helping you get through the registration process. We will just jump right into it because we want to leave a lot of time for questions today, make sure everybody has time to kind of ask all the detailed things that we um, might not get to exactly in the slides. But just to set things up, I just want to make sure everybody knows who XPRIZE is. We are a nonprofit based in Los Angeles. Um, our work is really around solving global grant challenges. We work across several different domains. Um, this team here has actually been with XPRIZE for um, a handful of years, we've all worked on the NRG COSIA Carbon X Prize together, which we just awarded earlier this year. That was a $20 million competition around carbon utilization. So definitely some overlap with what we're doing now, um, but we've learned some things and we're going to continue to grow the scope and impact um, with this new prize. So with that, I think we'll just kind of continue on here. Um, Oh, just to mention quickly, the other domains that XPRIZE works in are exploration, environment, and human equity. So we have a handful of active prizes right now across those domains. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You can see all of our competitions on the website. I don't want to dwell on that too much today. And then just for reference, this is kind of just a snapshot of all of the prizes that we have awarded in the past to date. How many have been launched, how many um, prizes we have in development, and you know, all the cumulative prize versus that we're handling. So you'll see that this is definitely the largest competition we've ever run. Um, we're very excited to have this size prize for us to incentivize new innovation around carbon removal. Um, so we'll just kind of go into the details of the competition here. Um, just the high level, what we're trying to do is increase the supply really of new carbon removal solutions. We want through the competition to leverage that platform to demonstrate the viability of new durable, low cost, scalable, sustainable carbon removal solutions. That's a mouthful, but we're gonna dig into what all of those words mean specifically and the criteria in a few slides. And then at a, <clears throat> at a high level, here is the timeline that we're talking about for the competition. So it's a four-year prize. We are really trying to hit the ground running, though. You'll see that we are trying to give out the first $20 million in the first year. That's pretty significant for XPRIZE. We have done milestone awards in the past, but the dollar value here is definitely much higher. We are trying to make sure we can get some seed funding out into the field for teams who have really promising ideas so that they have some capital to get started on demonstrating their ideas. So you'll see that we have kind of two different um, milestone points here. The first one is around our student awards. So we are accepting um, registrations for student-based teams and we will be giving away five, up to $5 million in student awards this fall. And then next spring, we will be giving away the rest of the 15 million in milestone awards for the most promising 15 teams. So those will be $1 million awards. And then the rest of the money is saved to the final year of the competition when we complete all of the demonstrations and get to do all the fun stuff around demonstrations and measurement and verification and judging. So we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And then we just wanted to mention quickly, you know, we consider the prize to be a platform to work with other partners who can really help catalyze the work of the teams, expand the impact more than what we could just do at XPRIZE. So we um, are working closely with Air Miners on their new Launchpad Accelerator. Um, they're partnering also with Creative Destruction Lab there. So if you have a new idea, you're kind of just getting started, you should definitely look at this program. It's an early stage accelerator. It's a six week program. They're running a cohort every quarter. So they're, I think, recruiting right now for their second group of teams. So this is just, you know, really support um, for founders to help think about establishing their team, your business strategy roadmap for your technology, customer discovery, some of the early questions that you should really be thinking about as you kind of start to form a new, a new startup. And then the other uh, program here is Circular Carbon Network. That's actually an initiative that we created through XPRIZE and 
we gather market intelligence across kind of the carbon landscape. So check that out. We have a bunch of um, indices where we compile all of the data for new startups working in the space. We profile all those companies and we've also been building a network of investors. So if you are fundraising, we have something called the Deal Hub and we can profile your fundraising deal there. So you can easily kind of submit your um, your details and it can be profiled to that network of investors. We've added these links and details into the newsletter that goes out to everyone who is registered for the competition on the prize operations portal. And so if you're getting that newsletter, you can also click these links easily at the bottom of that under the team resources section. And I think with that, I'll hand it over to Mike. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to just spend some time talking uh, in a bit more detail about what you need to do to compete. Um, so like Nikki uh, described, you know, we're all about carbon removal and we take uh, the demonstration of carbon removal very seriously, but anyone who can show us that they are removing carbon is in scope. We've worked really hard to try and keep this competition as broad as possible. And so the, the, the number one rule is that any carbon negative solution that removes CO2 from the air or oceans and sequesters it in a durable way is in scope. Now we talk about things in terms of these four categories, air, oceans, lands, and rocks, but we're totally open to hybrid ideas, uh, other ideas that, that maybe nobody's tried before. Um, you know, the, the field is really open for, um, for anyone who can you know, who can, who can rise to the challenge and remove carbon um, uh, to, to, uh, to, to come out and compete. So um, out of scope are things that do not actually remove CO2. So um, I know there are lots of folks who are interested in addressing other, um, other uh, GHGs, greenhouse gases. Um, we're really focused on CO2. We'd love to see um, solutions that might have a co-benefit and, re and reduce other greenhouse gases as well, but um, we're really focused on, you know, you kind of have to uh, remove carbon as a, as a, as a, you know, as the price of admission. Um, uh, we're also not interested in, um, in, um, in solutions that would source their CO2 from an already sequestered source like fossil fuels or the deep ocean. Um, Solutions really need, do need to be carbon negative. Um, so CO2 avoiding or CO2 offsetting solutions, while important as well, are, um, are not in scope for this competition. And um, obviously solutions which emit more CO2 than they remove would not be considered carbon negative. Um, and the, the last real important criteria is this idea of durable sequestration. And so um, solutions that cannot demonstrate the sequestration, durable sequestration of CO2 are not, um, are not in scope. So uh, technologies, for example, that produce pure CO2, um, you know, that's kind of an, we see that as kind of an intermediary and teams will have to sequester that CO2 in a durable way. So if you're a, say a direct air capture team and you produce a, a pure stream of CO2, we really wanna see you join forces with, um, with perhaps another team uh, who, who has a sequestration technology that can sequester your, your CO2 durably. So we're really interested in that full end-to-end -end technology and you have to do all those steps, um, both the capture and the durable sequestration um, in order to win the prize money. So um, what are we exactly asking you to do? The first and most important thing is to build and run a working demonstration. For phase one, in order to re um, to win uh, the milestone money, uh, we require a proof of concept demonstration. So we wanna see something working, but it doesn't need to be full scale. It doesn't need to be uh, full scope. Um, it might just be a, a portion of the solution, um, but we will also be asking for a detailed proposal for how you're gonna build out that solution into a fully operational concept over the next couple of years. And for phase two for the grand prize, um, we really need to see a full scale operating CDR solution. Um, our target is 1000 tons per year of CO2 removal. And, um, and you kind of just have to do it. You know, that's, that's really the crux of this competition. Now we'll also be asking teams to um, submit a fairly detailed cost calculation for, uh, for a scaled up version of the technology. So we're looking for um, cost estimates 
for um, what your solution will cost at a scale of one megaton per year. You don't have to demo that, obviously, but we are hoping that the demonstrations can kind of inform some of these calculations and test some of the assumptions. And then finally, teams have to make a case that their solutions are um, scalable to a gigaton and beyond. As everybody knows, the, the, um, the scale of the problem we're trying to address in, in terms of um, addressing climate change really will rely on gigaton scale carbon removal. And so we're interested in rewarding, um, we're interested in rewarding technologies which can clearly demonstrate the potential to, to um, scale to that gigaton scale and beyond. Um, in terms of how you'll be evaluated and judged, it really follows these same, um, the, the it maps very closely onto what I just described. So first of all, you'll be evaluated and judged on your operational performance. You know, does your equipment work? Um, is it, the, is it the, the scale that we asked for? Um, are you able to sustain operations? And then is your technology independently verified? This is one of the core, um, core uh, um, values of XPRIZE is that um, everything needs to be um, rigorously and scientifically validated. Um, the second, uh, the second phase of evaluation, I suppose, is on that um, question of, of um, sustainability. You know, first of all, is the is the sequestered CO two uh, sequestered durably? Is the um, is the technology in fact net negative? And does the technology have any sort of scale or rate limiting factors um, that might hinder? its scalability to uh, gigaton and beyond. And then finally, teams will be ranked by uh, their calculated cost. Um, so judges are really gonna look at all, um, all of this information, um, but the, uh, you know, it really starts with the demonstration and then, um, and then, and then ends with that, uh, that assessment of cost. So, uh, this is the schedule. Um, Nikki uh, alluded to this earlier, and um, here it is again in a little bit more detail, the, the, um, the submission and demonstration timelines. Uh, the student award submissions are due on October 1st. I'll talk about the student awards in a little bit more detail in just a moment. Um, milestone submissions are due on February 1st of next year. That will require um, evidence of a working demonstration, as well as a fairly detailed technical proposal. And then we kind of take a couple years off. Off, I mean, uh, we take a couple years to let you develop your solutions, and uh, we come back in February of 2024 and see what you've accomplished. So by February 2024, we really want to see um, eligible teams uh, demonstrate carbon removal at a at a scale of at least a thousand tons per year sustaining operations and just and just doing it you know um, this is not a competition of ideas this is not a competition of you know um, well you know I will do this in the future um, X prizes pay for performance and in this case we want to see you actually removing co2 in a sustainable way um, and that leads to the main event uh, the grand prize submission, will be, oh, I should mention that in February, 2024, we will be awarding um, 30 site visits. Um, so so uh, I guess a couple of key points here. Um, first of all, anyone can apply for site visits in February of 2024. You do not have to have won a milestone in 2022 to do that. So this is an open competition. We're keeping it open for anybody um, to uh, join at any time. And then in February 2024, we'll be awarding up to 30 site visits. We're going to go into the field and do verification. And those 30 teams will be the ones invited to submit for the grand prize. So there is kind of a cutoff, uh, as it were, in February of 2024, where you need to successfully um, receive a site visit in order to be considered for the grand prize. So what's next? First of all, if you haven't already, go to our website and read the guidelines. The guidelines are really um, the key document that describe the competition in detail. Um, they uh, contain um, lots of details on not just the main competition, but also the student competition. I'll come back to that in a second. We also have a frequently asked questions page on the website um, that we'd encourage you all to look at. 
Uh, we updated it not too long ago and it contains a lot of information and answers a lot of the most common questions that we receive from folks. Next, if you haven't already, register on POP. And Rupa is going to talk about what POP is. It's our online port registration portal. You only need to do this once. Um, even though our competition has several phases, um, once you're in, you're in. You know. Um, so uh, if you haven't done already, we'd encourage you to, uh, to register. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, your team and what you guys intend to accomplish over the next few years. And, um, and uh, once you're in, you're in. We will be issuing submission templates for the uh, student competition and phase one milestone submissions uh, later this summer. So we're just working on that. And those submissions will be due uh, by their respective due dates um, in October of this year and February of next year. And uh, those submissions will be uploaded to POP. So the same portal where you go to register is where um, those submissions will eventually be, uh, be sent to. And then uh, demonstrate the key component of your CDR solution this year and a fully operational solution um, by 2024. It's really as simple as that. Um, we do not have any other milestones or requirements. Um, it's really up to you to hit the ground running, build a team, raise money, get, the, get your technologies off the ground. So um, start developing your solutions. You know, um, it's really, uh, no, don't delay. And, um, and, and certainly don't, don't um, uh, wait for us to tell you what to do because uh, uh, the, the, the X Prize is really just about letting the world go to work against these hard problems. Okay, so I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about the student competition. And this is something we're really excited about. Um, we are, uh, we, we, when we designed the student competition, we really wanted to accomplish two things. We wanted to put some money into the field early and seed some, uh, some early stage ideas, but we really wanted to also um, sort of supercharge the young people in the world and, and, and focus young talent on this problem. And so um, the student teams are, uh, you know, our definition of student teams are, are, are fairly broad. You know, uh, they might be formed out of existing research groups. They might be student clubs on, a, on, a, you know, on any campus. Um, they may also be independently incorporated. So you don't necessarily need to be, um, you know, operating within the confines of, of a school. Um, but we do want student teams to be led by students and, and majority students. Um, so, so, you know, student leadership and at least 50% of the team um, should be students. We define students as um, people, as, as young people, less than 35 years of age. Um, enrolled at an educational institution um, for this academic year or recently graduated. So, um, so we, uh, you know, we, we, we want to see as many young people um, join the competition as possible. And so as far as the definition of a student is concerned, we're including both um, current students and recent graduates. Um, very young people can apply too. If you're under 18, you need to um, get, uh, you know, uh, sign off from a parent or guardian uh, when you register, but um, even folks uh, in in grade school could uh, could could apply for this funding um, if uh, if you guys if you guys like. Um, now we do want to see you identify an academic advisor or a business leader who is going to act as a formal mentor of the team, as well as a letter of support from an academic institution. So, like I said at the top, you don't need to be organized within that academic institution, but we do want to see um, a, a letter of support from an institution. So, um, so uh, that's really how we think about student, uh, about eligibility for the student awards. We have $5 million available for students and, uh, and uh, that includes awards for both competing in XPRIZE carbon removal. Um, we have awards up to, uh, up to $250,000 for uh, proposals to develop CDR solutions uh, to compete in the prize. And we are also interested in funding um, development of measurement reporting and verification technologies. So if you work on a research team, for example, and you're developing, say, uh, a really hot soil monitoring uh, device, or you're, or you're, um, or you're developing a, a really um, excellent new sort of software algorithm for calculating um, some, you know, some bigger and better way of, of calculating 
uh, cal calculating carbon carbon effects or something like that. Um, you know, we really want to see uh, those kinds of proposals as well. We have awards up to $100,000 um, for teams developing those kinds of technologies. And proposals are due on October 1st. So, um, so uh, again, download the guidelines. The uh, Appendix A in the guidelines describes the student competition in a bit more detail. The point of entry is exactly the same as uh, the main competition. Go to POP, register a team, and um, and then uh, you'll you'll be um, you'll be able to uh, uh, submit a proposal for student funding. How to register? Visit our website xprize.org/carbonremoval. Um, we hope to see you all there. Okay, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Nikki. I'm Rupa, Team Relations Manager for XPRIZE Carbon Removal. I'm just going to go through kind of quickly because we want to make sure we get um, plenty of time for questions about the registration process. So what is POP? POP is the prize operations platform. It's where you register to compete. It's where you create your team profile. Um, it's where you sign the competitor's agreement, pay the registration fee, and it's where you can look for other teams who are accepting new team members as well. It's also where you'll be uploading your submission documents when that time comes. Um, so it's kind of where, you know, a central hub for everything that we do um, on prizes at XPRIZE. So you access POP by, you can go to our website and click the register now button, or you can also go to pop.xprize.org and create a account there. So once you create account, you know, You'll get an email sent to you and you'll have to confirm your account to complete that. You'll get a message like this. Um, and once you do that, you'll log into POP and create your user profile. So that's just, it's, it's separate from your team profile. It's just sort of, you know, more about you and, and which prizes you're interested in and things like that. Um, so it's just, it's basic information about yourself. And once that's done, you can actually access all the prizes that are active. And here we've got XPRIZE Carbon Removal and in the second, the second block here, and you will cl click on Create a Team. So there you'll create your team. And um, once you're logged in as, you, as you know, the team you've created, you'll see a dashboard um, that has sort of you know, everything that you, know, you need for working in POP. Um, so activities, that's the activity section where it lists everything you've got to still do to register. So here it's completing team registration and payment and signing the competitor's agreement. Um, later on down the road, there'll be new activities added such as like complete your submission, um, things like that. So the team, the first part of the registration is team profile and paying your registration fee. So the team profile um, includes a registration form that looks like this. Um, it'll have a, a bunch of questions that, you know, we're really just asking you to gather information about um, people interested in competing. Um, I just want to note and stress and stress again that none of this information is going to be scored or evaluated by judges. Um, I know, you know, we've gotten requests to change things and um, worried that, you know, they didn't include enough or, um, you know, wanting to swap out descriptions and things like that. Um, we can help on a case by case basis with that. Um, but it does take some energy from our pop staff to keep to make those changes. Um, so just to kind of, you know, relieve any concerns, I want to make sure that's clear. This is really more information for us. Um, just to get a kind of understanding of the larger group of people who are interested and it's not counted towards you know, your evaluation. Um, the next step is to sign the competitor's agreement. Um, that's a legal document that's got all those sort of legal, legally binding um, language uh, that you're agreeing to in the competition. It's actually also a really good resource um, you know, to read through and make sure you read through carefully. And if you need tech support while you're in the platform, you can email popsupport at xprize.org. You can also look for other teams on POP. Um, there's teams that might be accepting new team members or say you're an individual. 
um, and you want to see, you know, maybe I have the skills to join a particular team. So once you're logged into POP and you can click on teams and do a search um, by skills needed. Um, so say here it's material science and chemical engineering because you have those skills um, and you filter by prize. You choose X prize carbon removal and you're looking for teams that are already registered. So you click you or you enter um, registered under the team status. Um, you can even look for city, uh, location, part of the world, even um, if that's, if you wanna narrow it that down, uh, narrow it down to that level. So say once you enter those fields, all the teams that are accepting new team members that meet all that criteria will show up. So here, let's pick on C negative. Um, so this team, you know, you can check their team profile out and look for, um, you know, uh, read their profile. And here it says we're currently accepting talented chemists, engineers, and designers to complement our team. So you kind of know, okay, this looks like an interesting team that I might want to join. You can click on apply to team. It's not a formal application. It's actually really just an app, uh, uh, a, a tool to communicate with that team. So you can enter your information, you know, your email, any other sort of details you want to include and click send. Um, the team lead of that team will receive a message like this. And when they log in, they'll see, oh, okay, this person's contacted me. Um, let me read what they've written. And um, if you kind of want to consider, um, you know, continue to talk to them, you can click accept. Um, so I want to stress here, there's a lot of great resources for you um, as you kind of come up with questions. And um, one of them, as Mike said, uh, mentioned before, absolutely the most important source I feel is the competition guidelines um, and also the FAQ. We are continuing to update the FAQ with questions that we get um, on an ongoing basis. So, you know, if there are questions about student competition, about IP, about the registration process, um, you can find, find them there. Um, we also have webinars and webinar recordings. Um, so under on the main page, there's an upcoming events and webinars page. Um, if you go there, you'll see all the upcoming webinars that are coming up. And we also upload our recordings of past webinars there. So watching those recordings can also be a great resource to you. And you can also contact us at carbon removal at xprize.org. So we've got some upcoming events um, calling all students. We have a student energy. Oh, actually that was, that's past. <laughs> I was out yesterday. So um, to those who joined, thanks for joining. I um, hope you found that helpful. We have our next Q and A webinar on August 4th at 4 p.m. Pacific. Um, another one on August 19th at 12 Pacific. And then we have a, another student energy webinar um, that is focused on, you know, how to prepare a winning X Prize carbon removal student application. Um, we'll have some past carbon X Prize judges join us, so it will be a great um, session to join if you are interested in competing for the student competition. Um, we also had some good success uh, last week. We had a matchmaking webinar. Um, some of you might have been on it. Um, it seemed to have been received well, and it's something we're trying out. Um, so we would like to kind of hold those regularly and um, we haven't uh, set the date yet, but we're considering mid-August. So you should be ha uh, hearing about that in some of our upcoming webinars and newsletters. So lastly, um, you know, for substantive questions about the competition, um, carbon rule at xprize.org is, is, is a, a great First stop and um, for tech support, you can always reach out through pop support at xprize.org. So now we'll get into Q and A. Um, if you wanna go ahead and type your questions into the Q and A um, section in, in the bottom of your screen, we can go through and answer those questions. Either we'll type answers in or we'll answer them live. Thanks. So the first couple of questions here, um, some good questions uh, from, from the audience here. So thank you, keep them coming. 
Um, the first question is about, about our choice of focusing on carbon dioxide rather than other GHGs. And um, basically, the, this is just, um, this was the scope of the competition that, that we designed. Um, it's focused on carbon dioxide, um, with carbon dioxide being the largest contributor to global warming. We certainly understand and appreciate uh, the folks who are working on other GHGs and, and you know, we'd love to support your efforts, but we need to see uh, um, uh, in order to create a, an even playing field, as it were, we are really focusing on CO2. And uh, so you have to remove CO2 in order to be in scope for this competition. Um, every team will be given the opportunity to articulate uh, other benefits of their technologies and um, removal of other GHGs would, would um, certainly be a, a, a very compelling um, part of that. So um, definitely uh, keep up the good work, um, focus on methane and, um, and the other GHGs out there, um, but we wanna see you um, remove CO2 as well. Um, the next question is about uh, another qu kind of question about scope. Um, somebody is is uh, describing a technology that they've developed that uh, that sequesters um, that sequesters CO two durably and profitably, but they do not remove carbon from the atmosphere. So, um, in order to compete, you will need to join forces with somebody who can do that removal. And um, one thing we would love to encourage you all to do. If you if you don't have the full solution, you know, in uh, d developed yourself, um, we we would love to see you partner with another team or bring on uh, br you know join forces with other experts who might have um, those other technologies um, that that can that can supplement uh, your technology and and um, demonstrate that full uh, scope of what we'd like to see. So the next question is about, about how do you sign up for the newsletter? Rupa, do you want to take that one? Um, sure. If you signed up in POP um, as, a, <clears throat> as someone interested in carbon removal, um, you know, as a user, or if you have a team profile, um, you know, the person that signed up with that their email that is who the newsletter is going to um, that's sort of how we export our lists if for some reason you are still not receiving the newsletter um, please let us know in the subject line say i'm not receiving the newsletter we get a lot of requests through our email and through pop so um, if it can stand out that'd be great and those will need to be manually added so um, yeah if you're not getting it for some reason please let us know. Okay, so the next question is, um, uh, says the rules prohibit making fuels from carbon dioxide. The rules also restrict the oceans to only the sunlight layer. It's unclear to me what, can't, what we can't do below the sunlight layer of the ocean. As an example, hydrated methane can be crystallized and stored in the deep ocean. However, this would be the creation of methane to a fuel. Okay, so um, there a couple of there's a couple of questions in here. So, um, so uh, fundamentally, it's up to each team to demonstrate that their method of sequestration uh, is in fact uh, durable and meeting the the durability requirements outlined in the rules. So. Um, I would not immediately uh, d dismiss this idea as being out of scope, um, even though you're using, you're creating a molecule that could be used as fuel. Um, what we want to do is ensure that there is a very low or very limited risk of re-emission um, once the, uh, once the, after the, the carbon has been sequestered. So um, I would not write that off as being um, out of scope. Now the issue around oceans is um, is the what we're targeting. What we're essentially doing is is expanding the atmosphere to include that first layer of the ocean, 
where there's a very strong buffering effect and and um, and uh, kind of a well-established natural flux between the atmosphere and the ocean. That's where we want the point of capture to be. So we don't want folks going into the deeps and and just dealing with the CO2 in the deep ocean, but we want to see folks um, capturing the CO2 in the surface layer of the ocean and then maybe perhaps um, accelerating the downwelling um, into the deep ocean where it can be sequestered durably. So, um, so I hope that helps. Uh, like I said, I, you know, we're working really hard to try and keep the scope as open as possible while maintaining those fundamental concepts of removal from the atmosphere and, and um, durable sequestration. So the next question is about, um, about funding. And this is something, you know, the question is, um, should we build a physical prototype in the first phase of the competition before getting any fund? And the answer is that's kind of how X prizes work. We pay for performance. We don't pay for, um, for proposals. And um, the only exception to that is um, the student competition where we are giving away some, some uh, grants based on proposals. Um, but uh, for, for, for everyone else, you are kind of responsible for going out and fundraising and um, you know, gathering whatever resources you need to uh, finance your prototype. And, um, and we will uh, rain money on the best ones. That's really what, uh, what we're here, here to do. Okay, somebody asked uh, to explain a little bit about sequestration in simple English. So um, I'll do my best here, but I think there are a lot of really good resources that I could point you to. Um, um, Nikki, help me out. Could is if if there's uh, if you could paste some some links uh, while I try to explain, um, that might be really good. Sequestration in its uh, simplest form is either converting the CO2 into uh, a, a different molecule that, um, that is more tightly bound and won't, won't go back into the air, um, or, uh, or otherwise storing the CO2 in a way that it's, um, it's not gonna re-emit into the atmosphere. And uh, I, I, I don't know if that's, if that's uh, simple enough way of putting it, but um, it's, it's really about trying to get those molecules out of the air where they're just floating around and then, and then putting them somewhere where they are not going to cause any more problems. And um, we, uh, we talk about uh, sequestration as, as having to be durable. And what that means is we want to make sure that the CO2 isn't going to escape from where it's stored. Um, for at least 100 years. And so again, I think there's a number of physical ways you could do that. There's a number of chemical ways you can do that. And we're really interested in any of those, um, those concepts. But um, that idea of taking those molecules from the air and putting them somewhere where they aren't going to cause any harm uh, going forward is, is, is kind of what we're getting at here. Um, I hope that helps. Um, like I said, I think there's there's some good resources out there that you can you can look at online and and uh, read about um, uh, sort of the the state of the art in uh, carbon uh, uh, carbon dioxide removal. I put a link to the CDR Primer website, which is a new resource that came out in the last year, and it's great. It gives you really a deep dive into carbon removal and all its different forms and pathways. So definitely take a look at that if you are new to the space. Um, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so somebody asks, can we use the XPRIZE logos? Um, uh, Rupa, you might have to help me out with this one. I'm pretty sure when you sign up for the competition, you will sign a competitor's agreement that tells you exactly what you can and can't use. There's, a, there's an appendix to the competitor's agreement called a media rights um, media rights something and yeah. um and that that kind of like tells you exactly what you can and can't do rupa do you want to expand on that yeah that's right um so read that read that section in the competitors agreement that's what i meant about the competitor agreement being a really good resource for questions that might come up as well um, also when you're a fully registered team you'll receive a welcome email that includes a um, toolkit that includes um you know some guidance on 
how to use the logos, um, what format, that sort of thing, and, and you know, when and how you can use them. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, here's a good qu question about uh, sails made for giga ships. I love this concept. I'm a sailor in my spare time. I love being on the water and um, you know and, and harnessing the wind and and uh, all that good stuff. Um, uh, the point of this concept is to reduce fuel cons uh, consumption um, on on large ships. This has the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is a really great idea, but unfortunately, it is not in scope for this competition. Um, this would be a emissions reduction uh, technology. That's how we would think about it. And um, unless you are somehow building into the system uh, a way of actually removing CO2 molecules from the air as you're, as you're going along, um, this would not be in scope. Um, Somebody asks about CCS, that stands for, um, for carbon capture and storage. Um, typically when folks talk about CCS, that um, uh, refers to um, geological storage uh, of the carbon dioxide in you know, potentially old oil wells or other underground reservoirs. Would that qualify? Um, the answer is yes, it would qualify. Um, the, uh, the uh, the only stipulation is we need that we need each team to um, make a credible case that the carbon is uh, sequestered durably, and um, and and you know many CCS projects have have satisfied that requirement, um, but you'll need to satisfy that requirement as well, and also that the system is carbon negative on a cradle to grave basis, and. Um, you know, you, you make the point that it's been around for decades and isn't the intent of the project to encourage novel solutions. The intent of the project is actually to remove carbon dioxide. That's 100% of our point. And we don't care how you do it. <laughs> so you can do it the easy way or the hard way or the middle way, um, but you really have to do it and you have to prove it. So, um, so we'd love to see CCS projects in addition to um, whatever other novel solutions um, folks can dream up. Then the last question in the in the chat box here is about um, about prototyping and um, independent verification. So, what is the minimum of independent verification you would expect? What would be an excellent independent ver validation? Um, okay, this is a great question. So, we are this is one area where we will be publishing a little bit more guidance um, just over the next uh, over the next uh, month or two here um, this summer. Um, we do want to provide some, some clarity on this. I think the gold standard of uh, independent verification would be uh, like a professional technology audit um, meeting some recognized standards, but that's not the only way to go about it. Um, that, that is, I'll admit, the most expensive way to go. And for many technologies, um, you know, those kinds of standards don't yet exist. And so um, really the, the fundamental uh, principle that we're concerned with is uh, making sure that the verification is in fact independent and that the verifier is, um, is sort of free of um, any conflict of interest or, um, or you know, doesn't, doesn't have a, really, uh, you know, a pre-existing relationship with, with the team. Um, and that the verification is, is, um, is credible and that it's conducted by, um, by uh, somebody who is uh, competent and um, and uh, considered, you know, an expert in the in the field. So I guess the direct answer to the question is, um, I think what you've described is uh, is probably along the right track. Um, 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 you know, bigger is better. <laughs> um, so, so the more verification you can provide, the be be better you'll be, but also stay tuned for more uh, details on that. Yeah, so because of the lockdown, we're not able to practically experiment in the lab. This is a really, um, a really, uh, you know, a really good point. We live in a very strange world right now. Um, the pandemic is not over. Um, but uh, unfortunately, you know, from, from as far as, as we're concerned, uh, we, we have to move this project forward. We have to start um, removing carbon dioxide. So we would really uh, encourage you to, you know, use whatever tools you have at your disposal. 
um, maybe uh, um, uh, maybe you'll have to find a new venue. Maybe you'll have to find some new resources. And and uh, I understand that's a that's a, a serious challenge. Um, but uh, you know you, you'll you'll have to you'll have to kind of hustle your way around around this one. I think. So the yeah, I mean the last question is about uh, removal of carbon dioxide versus other um, GHGs. So, um, so we're, we're just focused on CO2. That's, that's just the way, the way it is. So Chris, I appreciate uh, all of your questions, but, um, but this is uh, uh, the scope of this project and the, um, the, the award money will be directed towards um, carbon dioxide removal. Um, looks like we have a question. Oh yeah, do teams get brownie points for the extent of carbon negativity? Well, I think the answer is yes in the sense that um, the, 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 the more carbon negative you are, the easier it will be to hit that thousand ton per year. The thousand tons per year is on a net basis. So certainly, um, certainly the extent of carbon negativity is, a, is a, um, an important, an important factor. Um, when we say tons of, of uh, CO2, we're talking tons of CO2, pardon me, um, buddy, that just to answer your question. Oh, okay, this is an interesting question. We have an innovation hub with 100 first to 11th grade students from 12 countries. I love that. This is, uh, this is just what we wanna see. They're currently collaborating on six different solutions. Can they submit the six solutions in one portfolio then based on judges vote, continue to work on one of the solutions? Great question. Nikki, Rupa, what do you guys think about this? I. <laughs> I mean, I'll just say from from my perspective, um, you know, there's we don't have any restriction on the number of submissions that you can put in. Um, each team for students uh, student team, the registration fee is only twenty five dollars. So you could register six teams, and um, and and hopefully that's not too heavy of a burden. Um, but uh, Nikki, what do you what do you think would be the best approach here? Yeah, I think that's right. Um... You definitely can submit uh, multiple solutions. We think of it though as kind of like a one-to-one, -one. one team has one concept and we want each of the concepts to be unique. So think mm -hmm. about that if all six of them truly are unique or if some of them are kind of variations on the same end-to-end -end carbon removal solution. And then, you know, the judges will pick to fund their favorite. So you can kind of see if um, multiple of them get advanced or if just one of them gets advanced for funding purposes. And then you can determine, you know, how many you want to continue working on for the rest of the competition. So I hope that helps. We would love to see um, some submissions from your, from your group there. Thank you so much. Can you just add in the chat what the name of your group or your team is? So there's a question in the chat box um, around the, uh, you know, what will be required in the submission. Um, so the, the sort of the what, the, the, the requirements of the submission are articulated in the guidelines. Um, but the specifics exactly like what you have to type and, and, and where um, will, will be issued in a submission template that we are going to upload to the pop, uh, to the pop platform. So stay tuned for that. Um, the submissions will require quite a bit of writing. Um, think of it as, a, as a, you know, a, a pretty intense proposal. But we also are going to be asking for um, quite a bit of technical details, drawings and um, some engineering um, documentation, in addition to um, evidence of a working demonstration, which could include photos and videos. So I think to answer your question, uh, James, um, it's kind of like all of the above. Um, there, there will be a little bit more um, details to come on this point, um, but it, uh, the submissions are going to be uh, fairly, fairly comprehensive.
uh, would a project that makes only biochar qualify? Um, as long as you can demonstrate that you, your system is carbon negative and that your, uh, that the, the carbon will not be re-emitted and that it will be durably sequestered, um, then yes, uh, but, you know, certainly biochar processes um, qualify, but there's, um, there, the, you, you, uh, it, it won't be enough just to produce biochar. You have to demonstrate the whole system and, um, and prove that, that you are in fact um, removing, uh, removing carbon in a net negative way and in a durable way. Yeah, good question. Um, I have a question from Chris in the chat. Um, respectfully, the intention of the project is to remove carbon, not carbon dioxide. This was done um, during the NRG COSIA Carbon Rex Prize. As you know, how is this different? How is this prize different if you only focus on CO2? Uh, yeah, I, I think I've answered this one already. So, um, so we're just focused, we're focused on carbon dioxide here. That's the scope um, where uh, the, the funding is for carbon dioxide removal. And, um, and, you know, and that's, and that's it. I don't um, think we can, we can get into a debate um, at this, uh, at this time. Um, you know, we certainly appreciate and respect uh, all the good work that's going into um, other greenhouse gas mitigation. Um, but we're focused on carbon dioxide here. Thanks. Question from Keith, can a submission be completely audio and visual? Say a Camtasia presentation, assuming all technical data is presented. Uh, that's an interesting question. I've never had that question before. Uh, I don't know what Camtasia is, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't, I, I think the answer is no. I mean, we'll, there, there will be an opportunity. Um, I, you know, typically our submissions um, are, are sort of multi, um, multimedia in nature, we give teams an opportunity to upload photos and video, but uh, we will need to see uh, written, uh, there, there will be a written aspect of the submission. Um, yeah. So I mean, hopefully both, hopefully both. What if our co-benefits make our product profitable? Do we still need to minimize cost or could we optimize customer value instead? Yeah, good question. So if you look in the guidelines, we are asking teams to break down their cost calculations in a couple of ways. So there's the, there's the cost element. There's a, you know, this is like, like just the cost, ton, ton, dollars per ton of removal. Think about that. And then um, we are, we're also asking teams to articulate uh, cost of, of other kind of like, like externalities um, that uh, may be caused by their, by their process. So, so we're, th we're thinking about, um, you know, effects on, uh, on uh, the biosphere, biodiversity, that sort of thing. Um, and then we are also asking teams to articulate co-benefits and that could include revenue. And um, so, so the judges will be looking at, um, at all three of those, and 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 really, you know, summing them up to get your your uh, your total um, your total cost. So, um, so uh, you know, the question around should we be focusing on minimizing cost or optimizing customer value? Um, I don't think I can make that decision for you. I think my advice is to focus on. Um, on making sure that you can actually feel a successful demonstration, which may uh, force you into that customer value position. But, um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the idea of high quality and low cost solutions is, is, is paramount. Um, value adding solutions are, are absolutely a big part of that. If you have multiple ways to sequester CO2, do you need multiple entries? So our, our assumption was, I mean, Nikki mentioned this uh, in answer to a previous question. Uh, the idea is, is really we want to have a one-to-one -one relationship between like the, 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 te the team technology and the submission. So if you have multiple technologies at play, um, we would want to see um, multiple multiple submissions here. Um, 
yeah, buddy, good question. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, I think, I think, I think the answer is multiple uh, entries on this one. Um, <clears throat> question from Abhishek, is it given that page 22 and the guidelines be led, um, the student competition be led by a student who's enrolled in the 2021-22 academic year, but if any, if any student who has completed his education recently, I think the question is like, if they are not currently enrolled in the 2021-22 year, academic year, can they, all, can they lead the competition? Um, the, the student competition team has to be led by a student that is currently enrolled in at least one course um, during, for the 2021-2022 academic year. Your team can be composed of other students who have recently graduated um, if you provide you know, proof of that. So yeah, the team lead does need to be currently enrolled. Does CCS and enhanced oil recovery projects qualify? This is a tricky question. I know that uh, enhanced oil recovery is a, a slightly, it's a hot button topic in the, in, in the field here. Um, our uh, philosophy going back to what I said right from the top is that um, technologies must be carbon negative. And so um, I understand some folks are uh, working on trying to make a case for carbon negative uh, oil extraction. Um, I've, I haven't seen any, um, any uh, definitive proof that um, that uh, that this is the case. Um, I would uh, not say that you are out of scope right away, but I will um, I will say that uh, you know um, uh, technologies that uh, exploit and actually produce other carbon sources are going to be scrutinized very um, very closely by the judges. So. Um, so definitely sharpen your pencil and make sure you can make a, make a good case here. If our technology is dependent on natural resources, is it applicable? So um, I mentioned earlier the concept of breaking down this cost calculation and the, the second sort of category is around, um, is around uh, trying to, trying to put, put a cost on negative externalities. Um, we also have this concept of scalability to gigaton scale. And, um, and uh, if your technology is dependent on the exploitation of natural resources, we're really going to need you to make a very strong case that, um, that you are not sort of doing harm in another way and, um, and that you're not, uh, that, that your technology is, um, is still uh, uh, scalable. Uh, to a very, you know, to a massive extent, um, in spite of that reliance on um, natural resources. So I think if your uh, technology is dependent on natural resources, especially a, a non-renewable resource, um, you know, you, you kind of have to proceed with caution, but, um, but you are not, um, strictly speaking, out of scope. Yeah, so here's a question about sort of that, that idea of like doing other things besides CO2. The main goal is to remove CO2, but when we build the project idea and design the solution, should the project be only removing CO2 or can it do other things to help the environment? It can do whatever you want it to, as long as it removes CO2 um, and you know any, anything else that, that your technology does would, you know, that's, that's I should say that's beneficial, uh, would, would, be considered, um, would be considered a benefit. Um, so I think, uh, I think we're definitely open to, um, to those kinds of solutions. Okay, well, um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat here. Um, um, there are a few questions, I think, in the comment box, but if you could retype them in the Q&A box, we, I think we'd appreciate that. We do have a question. Um, 
from Nan in the, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing um, in the chat, um, or sorry, q &A. Can you please provide some clarification on the criteria relative to the amount of CO2 um, in tons per year to be removed from the oceans? Um, as the greenhouse effect is concerned with CO2 in, in the atmosphere, removing one ton of CO2 from the ocean surface layer will be equivalent to removing only um, one 150 ton of CO2 per year from the atmosphere. 150 is the partition coefficient between the ocean surface layer CO2 and the air CO2 during gas liquid phase exchange. Would it be fair and more correct to request much more CO2 to be removed from the ocean surface layer than from the atmosphere? Uh, that, this is a great question. Um, the answer is, uh, is uh, you know, the, as far as we're concerned, um, a ton is a ton. And um, uh, if, if, if you think it's easier to uh, capture from either the ocean or the air, then you could consider that a competitive advantage. Um, but uh, the requirements will be the same for all teams. So, um, so respectfully, uh, you know, best, best of luck. And, and I, I think I appreciate what you're saying, but, um, but we're keeping that requirement constant across all teams. Um, so, uh, it's a question about, is the purpose of the contest to prevent CO2 from various sources from going into the atmosphere or remove accumulated CO2 in the atmosphere? The answer is the latter. We're about removing accumulated CO2 in the, from the atmosphere. Question from... Milan, uh, would it be acceptable to take CO2 from industrial processes like pipelines to then transform it to either final sequestration or to synthesize pure CO2 for mm -hmm. later use in the manufacturing industry? No, that's not uh, in scope. So we need to see um, removal that begins in the atmosphere um, or the surface layer of the ocean and um, ends in durable sequestration. So um, sourcing CO2 from industrial sources would not be in scope. Okay, well, I think we're out of time and we're out of questions. I'm sure there's more questions uh, in the in the room, but we are at the top of the hour. So let's, uh, let's call it there. Um, uh, what's, uh, what's next, Rupa? Um, yeah, I think um, the next webinar is going to be on uh, August 4th. So that'll be our next Q&A webinar. Um, coming up. So we'll see you all then. And we'll be posting the recording of this webinar on our events um, page on our website. So hope to see you for the next one. Thanks for coming. <laughs>